Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tim Brown. I'm the organizing director for Philly Neighborhood Networks. Uh, those of you who don't, do know me probably know me for, from my canvassing and my phone banking and the town halls and the, and the rallies at City Hall and those sorts of things that we usually do. But my, um, my background, actually, my first organizing comes from what we call movement organizing. And, um, and that is, uh, that's a bit different. Um, that's, uh, that's where you put your body on the line in order to, to move uh, decision makers and, and, um, and the powerful to do the right thing. That could include um, sit downs, uh, banner drops, chants. Uh, we once did a Where's Waldo at, at um, uh, the state capitol, uh, interrupting uh, uh, official proceedings and uh, private events like, like, um, like fundraisers. Um, the idea is to, is to make the comfortable uncomfortable and, uh, and to push these decision makers uh, into capitulating to our, to our requests or demands uh, or to force them to make a, a mistake so that we can use it against them later on. Um, that's kind of the way the, uh, non what we call nonviolent direct action works. Uh, my first experience with this was a number of years ago. Um, it was the fifth anniversary of McCutcheon. Uh, I, um, I had or helped to organize uh, seven activists who went to the Supreme U.S. Supreme Court and put their bodies on the line to uh, call attention to um, Citizens United um, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, a <laughs> number of people were arrested that day, but everybody got got out um, uh, without uh, without charges being asked, um, uh, followed through on them. Um, and that led to uh, that led to another event where uh, I don't know if you can see it behind me, but there's a thing that says "Democracy Spring Up" on the wall behind me. Um, we did we marched. Um, anywhere from 150 to 200 people. Uh, it was a 10-day march. Uh, we went from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. to protest Citizens United, where thousands of people put their bodies on the line. Uh, it was an Im impressive uh, display of activism and uh, and really, really got me hooked on the thing. Uh, and that's, in fact, um, on the on the march to Washington, D.C. is where I met our tonight, this evening's guest. Excellent. Uh, so, uh... Yeah, really good to be with you all. Um, I'm just going to start just, this is kind of who we are uh, as March on Harrisburg. Um, over the last six years, we have marched uh, 298 miles, twice from Philly to Harrisburg, once from York to Harrisburg, once from Lancaster to Harrisburg. We've lobbied almost all of our 253 state legislators many times over. Uh, we've conducted over 35 nonviolent direct actions. Um, I was trying to count how many fundraisers we've disrupted. I think we're up to six total. Tim, we were talking about that earlier today. Uh, you know, and along the way, we've organized a statewide pro-democracy movement and uh, engaged in moral fusion organizing uh, with the Poor People's Campaign and Pennsylvania Action on Climate. Uh, we've helped force five House and Senate committee hearings on gerrymandering, moved uh, open primaries through the full Senate, and we helped fully pass vote by mail back in 2019. We have moved the gift ban out of its House committee twice, and we will fully pass that this session. Uh, the forces of corruption in Harrisburg have called us, quote, moronic, uh, quote, spoiled two-year-olds uh, and disgusting people. A legislator has nicknamed me a militant Hebrew school teacher and a mega lobbyist nicknamed me the rabid rabbi. When March on Harrisburg is in the Capitol engaging in active nonviolence, the whole Senate gets a text message that morning to let them know. The House uses their secret tunnels to avoid us and the Capitol Police shadow us. We fight against corruption and we fight for democracy. So of course, the empire strikes back. Uh, the former Speaker of the House's Chief of Staff once bluntly told us, you all may be marching on Harrisburg to pass the gift ban, but do you know who is marching on Harrisburg to stop it? Every single lobbyist in this city. Tonight, we're going to tell the truth. It's going to hurt. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be unpleasant, but it's going to be the truth. We're going to talk about Pennsylvania political corruption. We're going to talk about how our system works, what its values are, and the mechanics of how it operates. Tim, let's go to the next slide, please. The truth is, just to start, this is not a new problem. 
This is Alexander Hamilton, something that he wrote in his diary in 1794 on a particularly disgusting trip through Pennsylvania. He wrote, quote, the political putrefaction of Pennsylvania politics is greater than I had any idea of. And we can have a guiding quote as we move forward. So corruption is literally baked into our, not literally, metaphorically, baked into our state capital. Uh, the architect who built our capital actually went to jail for corruption, for graft. And today, when you go to the Capitol, you'll see that uh, even the best parking spots have signs that say reserved uh, for certain corporations and, and certain lobbying firms. Um, here's just a very short video clip uh, uh, just to show this. Teddy Roosevelt spoke at the opening of the Capitol, and he said something to the effect of let nothing happen in this place that can't be shown you know, in broad daylight. Um, and so he was speaking to corruption immediately. The architect of the Capitol was uh, imprisoned for graft on that building. So this is our history of corruption in Pennsylvania. When we go to Harrisburg to lobby, we park in a parking garage across the street from the Capitol. As we're leaving the parking garage, we walk past several parking spots that have signs that say things like reserved, Comcast, reserved, Shell Oil, they have parking spots reserved at the Capitol because they own that place. They own a seat at that table. And the public does not have a seat at that table. We are not being represented. What that guy said. Let's go with that. <laughs> um, so, right, there are a, a certain set of goals and values that are shared by all of the corrupt special interests that flood the halls of Harrisburg, the Congress, city and county councils, the courts, and every level of government from school boards to the White House. And this shared set of values that kind of guides everything and orients everything is found is rooted in greed and power. The goal is not public service, it is private gain, profiteering. And once you understand that the setup is, is that the whole system is set up that way, it really explains why things are the way that they are. The golden rule in Harrisburg is not love your neighbor as yourself. It's the guy with the gold makes the rules. This is a George Carlin quote here. He was one of our greatest stand-up philosophers uh, in, in our country, a, a national treasure. And uh, this is just him explaining this phenomenon here. You know, you don't need a formal conspiracy when interests converge. These people went to the same universities and fraternities. They are on the same boards of directors. They are in the same country clubs. They have like interests. They don't need to call a meeting. They know what's good for them. I was referring there to is that uh, ruling class agenda of uh, of greed and and power, and that that's the name of the game. And the results of this corruption, of this orientation toward greed and power, are devastating to Pennsylvanians. Um, one quick example is ecological devastation. Uh, there are 203 registered gas lobbyists in Pennsylvania. That's one for each of our 203 state representatives. They are armed with five to $9 million a year in lobbying expenses and gifts and about that same amount in campaign contributions. And we have no idea how much in dark money. Massive fossil fuel profits flow out of the state. Our land, air, and water are poisoned. We're riddled with cancer clusters. One in five kids here in Philly has asthma. And overall, Pennsylvania currently produces 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Let's go to the next slide. So why does money meet politics? Our ruling class ideology is greed and power. How can I make more money and how can I get more power? Because it is my God-given right to pursue profit and the false promises of the idol of money. And if the goal is to make more money, then one quickly realizes that a really easy way to make more money is to use your money to buy the law and get the, law, and get the government to make laws that will make you more money. Money in politics is when people with money buy public power in order to make private profit. This is a statue of boys. Oh, let's go back. Sorry, this, uh, this right here, this is a statue of Boise Penrose. Um, we're all in Philly here, I think, so people have uh, driven on his streets or around town. Um, this is a statue that stands outside of the Capitol building in Harrisburg. Uh, Boise Penrose was a Pennsylvania political machine boss and U.S. Senator over 100 years ago, and he understood how to use government to make his campaign funders more money. 
He was cynical, he was racist, he was greedy, he was a thoroughly corrupt enemy of workers, black people, women, poor people, immigrants, and everyone except for his oligarch robber baron bosses. And the joke about this statue in Harrisburg is that this is the only time his hand has been in his own pocket and not stealing from someone else's pocket. Let's go to the next quote, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, something Boise Penrose said to his oligarch campaign donors. He just lays out the game really nicely here. I believe in the division of labor. You send us, you, his campaign donors, send us to Congress. We pass laws under which you make money. And out of your profits, you further contribute to our campaign funds to send us back again to pass more laws to enable you to make more money. Our government's primary effective purpose is to protect money and power, not people and democracy. The people's interests are secondary, functionally, to the moneyed interests. And this is the harsh truth we're, we're facing tonight. Let's go to the next slide, please. So how does money enter our political system, specifically our state legislature in Harrisburg? Let's start with campaign contributions. Running for office costs money. It just does. To run for state rep or state senator, it costs tens of thousands uh, uh, to hundreds of thousands and sometimes into the millions. To be the governor costs tens of millions. To get to Congress costs tens of millions to hundreds of millions. To get to the White House costs billions. And so without public campaign financing, candidates need to go to rich people to get this money. Another way that uh, uh, enters our system here is dark money. We have no limits on transparency. Uh, I'm sorry, we have no limits or transparency on dark money political spending. Uh, we just have no idea how much is out there. We don't know where it's coming from. And you often interact with dark money uh, when it shows up as uh, mailers or attack ads, you know, the, the days leading up to an election. Uh, they often sow confusion um, and, and, and fear. Uh, that's usually dark money that's often hidden behind a name like um, Club for Opportunity and Growth or, uh, you know, United for Democracy or, or something that's or, or Moms for Justice or something that sounds really good. Uh, dark money is untraceable. Um, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, gifts. Uh, I, I'm sorry, dark money is also a really efficient way to uh, reward or punish politicians from the shadows. Campaign contributions go directly to them. They're made aware of them. Dark money is often used uh, from the shadows to, to protect or, or attack. Uh, gifts, it is completely legal in Pennsylvania for state legislators to accept anything as a gift from anybody. Vacations, concert tickets, endless whining and dining, sports tickets, it's all legal and routine. The legal definition of lobbying in Pennsylvania says, and I'm quote, providing any gift to a state official or employee for the purpose of advancing the interest of the lobbyist or principal. I'm going to read that again. This is the legal definition of lobbying in Pennsylvania. Providing any gift, something of value, to a state official or employee for the purpose of advancing the interest of the lobbyist or principal. In the English language, that's called a bribe. When you give something of value to a public servant to advance their interest, that's a bribe as are all five of these things, by the way. They're all just various forms of, of bribery. Um, we see about uh, 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 $1.5 million at least. We know that's an undercount in gifts a year going from lobbyists to our state legislators. Uh, some of the big ones last year were um, uh, all expenses paid trips to uh, Symphony in Austria and uh, going to the rodeo in Wyoming. A bunch of them went uh, out to the rodeo last year. Um, Side jobs. We have a full-time state legislature with a starting salary of over $100,000 a year, great health benefits, high per diems, which are of course untaxed, a state car, an incredible pension, and they're only in session about 45 to 50 days a year. It's a pretty sweet gig. And they can legally have side jobs, which is just a really great way for big business to just pay legislators directly. Uh, we need, of course, to ban these side jobs. Uh, the chair of the Senate Environmental Committee, um, somebody on this call was talking about a, a, a gas hookup bill, which just came out of the Senate. Uh, the chair of the Senate Environmental Committee, Gene Yaw, uh, is a practicing attorney for gas companies. 
He's also the chair of the Senate Environmental Committee, and he's a practicing attorney for gas companies. It's, it's incredible. Um, the revolving door. So you can hire legislators now to work for you and give them a paycheck, or you can give them a, a future job as well. And this is a, a very incredibly effective way of, of bribing legislators. Um, there's a, a famous mega lobbyist in D.C. named Jack Abramoff. Uh, he actually went to jail about 20 years ago because he pissed off John McCain. Um, he was doing what everyone else was doing, but he just pissed off John McCain, and it was a vendetta. Uh, he went to jail. Uh, Abramoff, uh, he would say that the, the most uh, devastating thing he could say to somebody um, was to offer them a future job. Uh, I'm going to read a quote from him here. He said, when we would become friendly with an office and they were important to us, and the chief of staff was a competent person, I would say, or my staff would say to him or her at some point, you know, when you're done working on the Hill, we'd very much like you to consider coming to work for us. Now, the moment I said that to them or any of our staff said that to them, that was it, we owned them. And what does that mean? Every request from our office, every request of our clients, everything that we want, they're going to do. And not only that, they're going to think of things we can't think of to do. Legislators and staffers are constantly spinning through the revolving door in Harrisburg and cashing in on their relationships and their experience by becoming lobbyists. When lawmakers know their current job is going to affect their far more lucrative future job, they behave very differently. Uh, just a couple examples um, from the last governor's administration. His chief of staff resigned early to become an Amazon lobbyist, and his uh, health secretary resigned early to become a UPMC lobbyist. This is just very common and, and routine, um, and it raises the question of who, who are they working for while they were public servants? Um, were they thinking about their current job or their next job? Uh, Tim, let's go to the next uh, 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 slide here. So we're just going to use one person to summarize all of this. Um, this is uh, Senate President Jake Corman, former Senate President Jake Corman. We chased him out. Um, he's no longer there. Uh, he, he retired. Uh, but this is his district office uh, from last year. Um, it just, it's just such a striking picture, the vultures just hanging out over his office. It's just it's a, it's a beautiful metaphor there. Um, but Senate President Corman was the, the head of the Senate, the very, very powerful senator. Um, he would, um, and I'm sorry, also this picture was taken on a day when we tried to, to go have a meeting with him and he of course locked the door. Uh, you know, we then, uh, after that, um, disrupted his fundraiser at a golf course nearby because uh, that's where he was. Uh, so the uh, uh, Corman raised millions and millions of dollars over the years in campaign contributions from many different big business interests, uh, primarily Wall Street, fossil fuel money, um, and a lot of money, especially from uh, Glenn Hallbaker Incorporated, which is a construction firm um, out in his area in Center County, uh, which was successfully sued for tens of millions of dollars in wage theft. Um, they, they are a, a, a terrible, terrible employer. Um, Corman would then go to uh, places like Palm Springs to raise money from large corporations on behalf of dark money groups that would then spend that money on him. His former chief of staff ran a dark money group. He would fundraise from um, executives at golf courses. Uh, we know, um, you know, Wawa and Sheets like to pretend that they uh, are, are rivals. Uh, they, they both donate to Corman's dark money fundraisers. Uh, you know, they're, they're on the same team. Uh, the, the, the rivalries are, are nonsense. Uh, Coke and Pepsi both support the same low-wage policies. Um, uh, uh, Corman uh, would take all sorts of gifts. Um, the symphony in Austria, he was one of the ones that went to that last year. Uh, he went to the Bahamas with the Lawyers Association. Um, he would constantly go golfing in Florida and California. Uh, he, he was everywhere and everything. Um, and then uh, while he was Senate president, he also worked a side job uh, as a board member for Old Dominion Bank. Um, so he was a Wall Street board bank board member while being Senate president. Um, and now that he has recently retired from public service, he has spun through that revolving door and just opened a lobbying firm with his former chief of staff, uh, and, and a bunch of other entrenched political operatives uh, and former colleagues and, and staffers. So all together, does that sound like a public servant? Do, do we wonder why the legislation that's passed is just, 
One of the big things Corman did before he left was pass a $90 million subsidy to crypto mining. Mm -hmm. It's just, what the hell is that for? <laughs> what are we doing? Um, it's the stupidest. And, and he, his uh, uh, new lobbying firm has finance clients. Um, this was, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's keep going here. I'm disgusting myself with these words. So let's keep going. Uh, so uh, uh, here's just a quote. Um, from our, our, our current president, and uh, uh, this is something he said in 1974 when he was a young um, freshman U.S. senator. Uh, and, and what he's talking about here is just kind of how to be successful in, in our system, one really needs to lean toward the green and, and kind of develop an instinct to become responsive to people with money, that, with the money that you need to amass the power that you want. So you kind of start to just lean toward those folks who have that money that can buy you that power. Uh, and so this is something he said back in 1974. He said, the system does produce corruption. Implicit in the system is corruption. When in fact, whether or not you can run for public office, and it costs a great deal of money to run for the United States Senate, even from a small state like Delaware, you have to go to those people who have money and they always want something. I think it's the most degrading experience in the world to have to go out and ask for money, because unless you accidentally agree with the position taken by the person or group that has the money, you run the risk of deciding whether or not you're going to prostitute yourself to give the answer you know they want to hear in order to get funded to run for that office. And it's coincidental in many instances when you happen to agree with where they are. And you run the risk, by the way, of rationalizing it. It's kind of frightening to see somebody spell out the next 50 years of their career there. Uh, he, he, he rose high in that system. He played the game, as they all do. Um, I just want to take a step back here as, as we're about to talk about hyperpartisanship and just note the nonpartisan nature of this, of this entire talk. Um, we're not talking about any group of, of people or tribe or, or, or party or uh, politician. This is about the system that, that we're all swimming in here. Um, this is a, a famous cartoon here. Uh, you can see the king looking out at, at a bunch of people with uh, pitchforks and torches and his advisor saying to him, oh, you don't need to fight them. You just need to convince the pitchfork people that the torch people want to take away their pitchforks. So let's talk for a second about the role of hyperpartisanship in, in this system. So because, because of the um, ruling class's systemic pursuit of greed and power, there will be working class reactions to challenge that concentrated greed and power, right? There always will be, there will be a reaction. And a tried and true method of maintaining control is divide and conquer. And this divide and conquer strategy plays out politically through our structural and artificial hyperpartisanship, dividing us into political tribes, mostly based on fault lines of race, gender, religion, geography, sexual orientation, education level, and anything um, and, and everything. And while we are divided, the general conquering continues mostly unchallenged. And so we're locked into this, this two-party system pitted against each other with not much change. And uh, so just let's just go into three, three mechanisms of, of how this uh, works. Uh, one is gerrymandering. Um, we are, uh, uh, I'm sorry, gerrymandering is when district lines are drawn by powerful legislators to favor themselves and, and their friends. It creates non-competitive districts where one party has a locked-in majority over the other party. And because one party has that built-in advantage, the primary election becomes far more important than the general election because the primary winner is generally guaranteed a, a, a general election victory. But despite the, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, and, and gerrymandering also results in, in about a dozen or so competitive races every year, uh, a dozen to two dozen competitive races out of 253 legislative seats. Uh, so when you divide the turf, um, there's only a few battleground points. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we have these, these closed primaries too. Um, even though the primary election is the more important one almost all the time, uh, we have closed primaries so independents are locked out. And then we also don't have ranked choice voting. So we have uh, an election system that uh, keeps third parties from participating um, and gives voters very little choice. 
uh, at the ballot box here. Um, if you think of like a Dr. Oz, someone who can win a primary with a higher unfavorability rating than a favorability rating, uh, which is just absolutely amazing. I'm going to pause here for a second. I've talked a lot. We're going to go on for, into um, how Harrisburg is internally structured in a second and some other things, but I just wanted to create some space. How are you all feeling? I'm throwing a lot at you. How, how are people feeling? Pretty rough, Michael. There are some game. Yeah. Yeah, the level of corruption is just disgusting. It really is. It's intense. It's a lot. Michael, I'm curious if um if you could potentially send notes after yeah. because um this this statistic of one percent of our I'm assuming that's carbon emissions or because yeah. methane would be um, different um, comes from Pennsylvania. I think that would be a useful uh, fact to cite and other things I'm working on. Absolutely, I'm just cutting. Also, that. whenever you talk about y'all, I'm angry. Don't <laughs> be <It's> so angry. <laughs> yeah. Are there books we could read to help us figure out what's going on and how this? Um, the government structure and everything. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, so many. Uh, let me think for a second on where to start. Is, is there anything in particular that, that, you're, that you're looking into? Well, I would like to know the structure, how the government structure, what are the, the roles of the um, elected, elected officials. I like to have, like, um, know what the current events, what's going on from a more leftist point of view and yeah, just about that. Yeah, um, Linnea, first your question. Uh, um, please, I'm gonna put some words into, into the chat here. Uh, Greg Vitale, Marcellus Money presentation from 2017, um, I believe. Greg Vitale is a state rep. Uh, he. Uh, this presentation is on YouTube, um, and that's where those fossil fuel stats uh, come from. Um, he's, he's still there. He's actually going to become the chair of the Environmental Committee on the House side now that the, the chamber flipped. Uh, oh, he's a fascinating human being. Um, it's always good to good to see him. I love him. He's my favorite. Whenever I tell whenever I talk to people about canvassing, I mention I tell the, the story of Greg Vitale, who, who every like three or four times a week, he pulls his car over into a neighborhood, gets out, just starts walking around and knocking on doors and talking to neighbors. They all love him, even though it's now leaning Republican. and He's a Democrat. He continues to win his his district handling. Yeah, he's. He, that, that was that was his way of dealing with the system, right? He had the option of going for big money and running a big money campaign or being a fanatical door knocker. And that's his protection is that he's a fanatical door knocker. And I mean, he's been doing this for 26 years. It, what Tim described, he's been doing that consistently. He's knocked every door in his district multiple times over. And that's how he inoculates himself from the big money pressures, right? Yeah. There's ways of doing it. It's very hard to do. If you think of like a Bernie Sanders, he avoids big money uh, contributions um, by having a national fundraising base of digital small dollar donors. That's very hard to pull off. There are ways to inoculate yourself uh, within the system. Um, Thomas, to get back to your question, uh, uh, you're, I think you're looking for a Civics 101, um, which March on Harrisburg does, does offer. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll, we'll put that up. Um, until then, uh, if you just search around... Um, the state websites, uh, you know, just go to the house website and just kind of look around and give yourself a deep dive education and just kind of Google around uh, for, for civics lessons. Um, there's definitely stuff out there. Uh, and then as far as kind of media is concerned, um, for uh, uh, Pennsylvania specific media, um, I, I definitely, Spotlight PA does incredible work, uh, as does PA Spotlight. Um, Good luck not getting those two confused, uh, PA Spotlight and Spotlight PA. Uh, Pennsylvania Capital Star does good capital coverage. Um, and on a national level, uh, you know, I, I love uh, The Lever, which is uh, David Sirota's new publication. It's a follow the money uh, oriented uh, media group. They're, they're great. Um, they just follow the money and, and tell the story. Uh, and then uh, I'm partial to democracy now. I think they give just great, great headlines. 
If I may, I think Tommy was talking about, um, I was trying to get a sense of like, how do these things flow through a committee and stuff? Are you going to cover that tonight or is that? Definitely, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So you get a sense of how all this stuff and who's 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 throwing the blocks and that sort of stuff. Let me uh, let me go on mute and I'll pull the screen back. Let's do it. Let's get into the rules. <laughs> and, and let's just take one step back here um, and just remind ourselves that all of this adds up to an a non-responsive government that hurts people. And, and we all know that hurt in our lives, whether it's just a failure of housing policy or healthcare or, or, or education or infrastructure or unfair tax code. Um, or you know, low wages. Uh, we're all affected by these policies, and these policies are driven by by this corrupt system here. Um, so let's talk about how a bill becomes a law. So we have no ballot initiative process in Pennsylvania. So to pass a law in the state of Pennsylvania, you have to go through the state legislature. And we're taught that that is as simple as winning a majority vote in our 203 member house and winning a, a majority vote in our 50 member Senate. And then of course, getting the governor to sign it into law. So if you have 102 reps, 26 senators and one governor, you should have a law. But of course it, it isn't really that easy. Um, and also I just wanna note that this uh, chart we're using those names uh, under gatekeepers this is from last session. Um, the, these, these names have changed because we've chased a few of them out. It's been a fun ride. Um, so we have, uh, 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 for a bill to pass, it needs to win four votes. So it needs to win the House Committee, the House Floor, the Senate Committee, the Senate Floor. And whether or not those four votes happen is controlled by six legislators. Mm -hmm. so it's not about winning the votes necessarily. It's about just getting the votes. That's where the, the problem is. The House and those six legislators are the House and Senate committee chairs, the House and Senate majority leaders, the House speaker, and the Senate president. If any of those six powerful legislators out of all 253 of our legislators opposes a bill, they can single-handedly block it. To become one of those six gatekeepers, you often need to raise a lot of campaign money to dole out to your colleagues to buy their votes. This campaign money comes from powerful special interests. The end product is gatekeepers who are beholden to powerful special interests. And just to complicate this picture a little bit here, a bill actually needs six votes, not four votes, to pass in reality. Because in between the committee vote and the floor vote, there's this secret vote called the caucus, which is when the members of the majority party will meet behind closed doors and discuss the bill. And if a majority of the majority party does not support a bill, then it doesn't advance to that next vote on the House floor or the Senate floor. There's no public record of caucus votes. We have nothing from the inside except what they leak. And that's how bills are often killed without any fingerprints on the body. So just to recap here, it takes six votes in practice, four votes according to the constitution, but six votes in reality for a bill to become a law. It has to be approved by all six of those gatekeepers and it has to be approved by a majority of the majority party behind closed doors in each chamber. This is an authoritarian, anti-democratic legislative structure. When one gatekeeper out of 253 legislators can block, any, can block a bill, that's really messed up and it happens all the time. There are periods of time in our capital where one in five bills that they're passing are what we call bridge namers. They name bridges. That's about all they can get done. Problems stack up, don't get solved year after year. Things get worse, they're naming bridges because very corrupt special interests can bottleneck anything. 
So all of this adds up to a system that rewards legislators for leaning into hyperpartisanship and doing the bidding of corrupting money special interests. If a legislator steps out of line and decides to buck this system, they can be badly and quickly hurt and destroyed. Here are some things that we've heard um, back in September. I'm going to take a step back. Back in September, we tried to bypass this system. We had gotten the gift ban out of the House State Government Committee for the second straight session, and House Majority Leader Kerry Benninghoff was blocking it and saying, we're not going to call a vote on this on the House floor, blocking that second vote there on the chart. And so we decided to pursue a rare legislative maneuver that has not worked since 1921. It's actually the maneuver that ended Boise Penrose's career. He died shortly after, they say, from a broken heart because the House revolted against him using a maneuver to bypass the majority leader. And when we were looking for champions to back this plot, here are some things that we heard about how they'll get knocked back by leadership. Leadership is what you call the majority leader, the, the speaker, the Senate president, the committee chairs, the, the other positions. Leadership was telling people, we'll draw you out of your district. We'll just gerrymander you out of your district by a half a block. You no longer live in your district. Uh, we'll, they'll be challenged by a well-funded primary opponent. Leadership will direct some funds towards somebody to just drag your name through the mud with uh, a, an aggressive campaign. Uh, they can do the same thing with dark money attacks. Um, we were told that uh, some were, were fearful of getting kicked off of their committees. It happens all the time. Uh, losing funding for projects in their district. Uh, all of their bills and all of their bill language being dead on arrival. Having their staff fired and even having their office furniture removed. That one's happened a few times. If a legislator plays ball in this system, they can get a safe gerrymandered district, they can get protection from well-funded hyper-partisan echo chambers, they can get campaign funding to spend on themselves and dole out to their colleagues to buy leadership positions, they can get a good paying side job, a great paying future revolving door job, endless gifts like Super Bowl tickets and vacations, good committee assignments, and an opportunity to pass their bills as long as the bill doesn't threaten the special interests. So this is the system that our state legislators operate in. They're all keenly aware of this, although it takes, the, it takes them about two to four years to figure it out. And there's a temptation that is ever present in the life of a legislator to just play ball and not buck the system. One state rep told me one time, he said, every Saturday I see an executive from Comcast. Our kids are on the same soccer team. And every time I see him, I know that I can ask for a couple hundred thousand dollars and he would give it to me right away. But we would both know what it means. I would have an open door policy for Comcast and do what they want. But with their money, I could buy my way into leadership. I could be the speaker of the house. And from there I could get to DC and end up in the cabinet one day. I know I'm smart and talented. And every Saturday I see him and I don't know how much longer I can go without asking him for money. To summarize all of this, a famous and very comprehensive Princeton study of thousands of federal legislative outcomes in Congress in the 80s and 90s, talking what happened in US Congress in the 1980s and 90s. They looked at all of these outcomes, every bill passed, every policy made. And they found that the preferences of the general public and I'm quoting here, have a near zero, non-significant impact on public policy. That's the harsh truth. The preferences of the general public have a near zero, non-significant impact on public policy. Government is the central decision-making center of our society. And the decisions that it makes as laws, executive actions, and court rulings lean toward private gain and not toward the public good. They lean toward big money and not toward people. Let's go to the next slide, please. One more slide, please. So the goal of the working class is to use government to ensure the public good. Right? I think everyone on this call, we all agree in government and the power it has to, for, for public good. 
this means things like ending the war economy, ending systemic racism, ending poverty, ending ecological devastation. This means things like healthcare, housing, education, transportation, a clean environment, dignified work, peace and security and safety. It means what it says in the preamble to the US Constitution. Right? This is our founding document here. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. The promise of democracy is government of, by, for the people, and we are not there yet. And just to note that this rhetoric from our founding fathers is extremely lofty and democratic, but the details inside favored money and power over love and democracy from the beginning. Things like slavery, the electoral college, only 5% of the population could vote, uh, how one became a senator through state legislatures and not direct elections, and other structural decisions that favored money over people from the get-go. But the story of democracy in the US is working class organize, the working class organizing into powerful movements to fight for more democracy and for our basic human needs. And all the while, the ruling class attempting to divide and conquer the working class for the sake of plunder and power. And so we fight on because when we fight, we win. And we've won many things over the years. Let's go to the next slide here. So this is just a, a prime briefer on, on how we win uh, coming from a movement perspective. Um, uh, th these are some uh, uh, goals that um, are, are very much shared within the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, this, this is what we call um, well, I guess point two just says it, moral fusion organizing. So number one, leadership development. Uh, we develop clear, competent, committed, and connected leaders. Uh, thank you all for, for coming tonight. This, this is an exercise really in clarity, uh, th this, this presentation. That's what this one's aimed for, is, is trying to create clear uh, understandings of, of how our system works. Um, Second thing there is, is uh, moral fusion organizing, and that really means building permanently organized movements across all lines of division and across all issues. Uh, only moral fusion organizing can win. Uh, we have to avoid constant divide and conquer tactics. Um, and uh, when we come together, we, we win. Uh, and then the third part here, and we'll, we'll dive into this a bit, um, carrying out aggressive and bold nonviolent tactics to win short-term and intermediate concessions while using those fights to further build the movement in the pursuit of revolutionary democracy, a government of, by, and for the people. And uh, let's go to the uh, next slide here. So just um, looking at some, uh, these are our four ongoing campaigns as March on Harrisburg. Uh, but I just wanna take a step back here and talk about nonviolence. Uh, Tim, Tim touched on it earlier. The, the goal of nonviolence, um, Tim, you gave the, the political uh, definition of it. Um, I'm going to go with the rabbi's definition of it, uh, which is going to sound uh, far more lofty, um, but it's, it's definitely the, the way I approach here. Uh, you're, you're trying to redeem the other person. You're, 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 you're forcing an encounter with people in power to make them confront your suffering and to make them uh, see you as a human being and feel an obligation to serve. There's a famous philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas. He was a French Jewish philosopher. He said that when you see the face of the other, you are ordered and ordained to service. And, and that's the reaction that nonviolent that nonviolence is aimed uh, at getting. You force the encounter with the obstruction, with the corrupt politician, and you make them see how corruption hurts you. And you make them see how corruption hurts them and you make them confront that truth and you pray for redemption. And you make them confront that truth at very level, varying levels of intensity, everything from just a lobbying meeting all the way up to I'm sitting in your office and I'm not gonna leave until we sit down and figure this out. And nonviolent direct action is incredibly powerful. It, 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 has redeemed, it does redeem people. Uh, more often it affects the people around the person you're going for. It affects the people around your target. So March on Harrisburg, we faced four obstructions, uh, all on the gift ban campaign there um, over the last six years. And not one of those four obstructions has come back the next session with the same power. And not one of them has lost at the ballot box. 
Senate uh, State Gov Chairman Daryl Metcalf. We got him kicked off the House State Gov Committee. He's actually retiring fully this year. We, we made him irrelevant um, after 10 years of blocking every civil rights bill and every democracy bill. Uh, House Speaker Mike Terzai, gone, resigned abruptly. House Majority Leader Kerry Benninghoff uh, uh, lost his uh, uh, leadership position and is going to resign abruptly uh, pretty soon. Um, his campaign uh, uh, opponent called him bought off Benninghoff uh, during the whole campaign season, uh, just really dug into him. Uh, and then Jay Corman, Senate President, um, just decided to go home rather than continue to face the encounter, which would force him to deal with this issue. Um, there's no defense of corruption, and then they know it. Uh, so our four active campaigns here, uh, one is the gift ban. We've talked a lot about that tonight. Um, there have been 35 bills introduced in the last 23 years to make bribe, to make these gifts illegal in Pennsylvania. Uh, two of them have passed out of committee, one in 2019 and one in 2021. We, we moved them both. Um, and we almost forced a, a, a mutiny on the House floor in September. It was very fun. Um, we, uh, both party leadership just berated and lied to their, their members to, to avoid this. It was a very panic day in, in Harrisburg. Um, and then uh, uh, we're, we're hopeful to pass that this year. Um, ranked choice voting uh, is uh, another one. Um, we're trying to uh, make it so that you can uh, rank candidates and have an instant runoff system so that you avoid folks like Donald Trump winning the 2016 Republican primary with like 20 something percent of the vote. Uh, with with a majority of voters hating his guts. Um, think about our, our mayoral race right now. How great would it be if we had an instant runoff system where we have, you know, a dozen candidates on the ballot? And so, you know, Jeff Brown doesn't win with with 12% of the vote. Um, and uh, then uh, I'm just going to breeze through the next two here. Uh, National on Climate. This is a coalition of anti-corruption activists and uh, climate activists. Uh, this group, Pennsylvania Action on Climate, uh, it does nonviolent direct action trainings, and it does nonviolent direct actions. It's a very focused uh, campaign. Um, it does a lot of disrupting of fundraisers where ecological devastation is, is taking place. Uh, last month, it was uh, Senator Mike Regan. Month before, it was Senator Scott Martin's breakfast fundraiser. Uh, two months before that, it was the Pennsylvania Society dinner in, in New York City, which is where the Pennsylvania political elite run away once a year to the Waldorf Astoria in Manhattan to get bribed. Um, and then the fourth campaign is, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Poor People's Campaign. Uh, please plug into that. Just sign up, poorpeoplescampaign.org. We'll get connected. Uh, and then this final thing here, um, Disrupt the Corrupt Tour. So we are coming, uh, we're, we're going across the state. Uh, we did this back in 2018. We did about 20 events in three and a half weeks, everywhere from Erie to Philly, Scranton to south of Pittsburgh. Uh, we're doing it again, less stressful schedule this time. Uh, we're stretching it from April to, to June. So we're gonna be, um, and I'm gonna send Tim this, this info to, to blast out. Uh, we're gonna be in uh, Germantown on May 17th. Um, in the evening, and then we're going to be on uh, the UU on Stenton Ave um, on June 11th, which is a Sunday uh, in the evening, and then we're going to be um, in the in Northeast Philly at some point too, that one's still getting up on the calendar. Uh, so stay tuned, and, and Tim will, will have details to send out for that. Um, and the goal of that uh, tour is, is to raise up an army to get organized. Uh, so there's going to be far more specifics on, on how to get involved and, and whatnot um, at that tour. And then uh, uh, let's just go to the next slide here. Um, just join our Slack. Uh, there's so much going on. There's four active campaigns. There's working groups. There's chapters. Um, there's always calls to action. There's just constantly so much happening. Uh, please join our Slack. Um, send me a, a, a message. I'm gonna put my email in the chat right here. If you just send me an email uh, with the word Slack in it, I'll invite you right in. You'll get a, a message. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Slack, we have a training. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just uh, uh, end there. Um, yeah, questions, thoughts. How are people feeling? Uh, Michael, thank thank you uh, for taking some time tonight out of your busy schedule to go through this with folks. 
Um, you know, they, I just love doing this, this kind of work. It, it's, it's really fun. I, uh, we've marched together numerous times. I, I, I play the, I usually play the role of, uh, of jail support. Um, so I play dress up and I go there and I talk with the cops and find out where they've brought the activists. It's, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun for anybody who, who has, has not done something like this and think, oh my God, um, it's actually kind of fun. Like we've a, a number of times gone to uh, sit in front of, like for instance, we had five people dressed as Waldo. We did a where's Waldo running around the city, ca the, the capital. And we were, and we had somebody filming each of the Waldos to capture that. And then we sat, we had the Waldo sit down. I was looking for a photograph of it. I couldn't come up with it in time for the meeting. Uh, the five Waldos are just sitting there and they're chanting and singing. And there's all these people chanting and singing around them. And I remember a lobbyist was trying to push his way through and he couldn't get through. And he, he yelled at the cop, why don't you make them get out of the way? And the cop said, why don't you go down the stairs around the back like the rest of the lobbyists? And that's when I knew that we had won the hearts and minds of the police force in, in, in the state capitol. When we first started out, they were pretty rough. Um, and then over the course of a number of years, they just sort of got used to us. I kind of remember that commercial, that there's a cartoon, uh, an old uh, Looney Tunes kind of cartoon, a Bugs Bunny cartoon, where there's the wolf and the, and the, and the sheepdog, and they punch a clock, and then there's all kinds of craziness goes on at the end. It's like, see you, Ralph, see you, John, and they punch the clock at the end of the day. I feel like that's sort of like, that's the kind of thing and the role we play there with the police. Um, I, I think... I think we I think it's great that we really disrupt um, the the very comfortable people who are, have been sitting in positions of power for so long. Um, as Michael said, we're going to have some uh, opportunities for you guys to get involved. Um, but before and before we go, uh, I, if anybody has any questions, I see Paula, you have your hand raised. Would you yeah. uh, go? Ahead. Yes. So given the inf the structure you've put out there for us, this is my question. When we have people in Harrisburg, like Art Hayward and um, Stephen Kinsey, they're my reps, you know, they're my people up there. Basically you're saying that they have to accept the system and, and manip the best they can work inside it to get some things for their community. Yes. From our point of view as people who live in the community, is there any way there, there's almost no, no way in the picture you've, created for us to really influence what they do. We can assume their values, they'll try to do the best they can within a very corrupt system. So therefore, is there any form of pressure or dialogue that we in different community groups should be having with those, with them, or should we just leave them be and send them cupcakes or something? I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, because it's gotta be horrible to be up there. It, it is. And, and I'll, I'll talk about Art Haywood uh, for a second here. Um, I, I love the guy. Uh, he's great. Um, I, I see him often in the Capitol. Um, I'm, I'm close with, with some of his staff. Uh, you know, he told me that when he first came into, uh, became a state senator a few years ago, he had a, a six to one rule, meaning um, for every six meetings with lobbyists, he had to take one meeting with a voter. He couldn't meet that rule in Harrisburg because the, the voters aren't there. It's swarmed with mercenaries. It's swarmed with, with paid advocates who go in to push a corporate agenda. Mm -hmm. And that this was Haywood. And, and he's, he said this a few times over the years. He's, he's crying out for help. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he really is. Uh, when he did that poverty tour going across the state, he knew that everything he gathered from that was not going to become law. What he was doing was he was trying to go around and rally folks to, to put pressure on, on people. Mm -hmm. um, Haywood has been incredibly encouraging on the need to organize uh, uh, as March on Harrisburg and, and the need to organize a movement. Um, and especially he loves the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and, and he appreciates, you know, when we get in the face of, of corruption and, and disrupt it. Um, there are a number of people in, in the building like that um, who, who uh, have been able to kind of inoculate themselves a little bit from the pressure and kind of keep a little bit of their core values intact. Uh, they're marginalized though. You know, Haywood doesn't have power in the building. Um, if, you know, the Senate flips, 
uh, and Democrats were the majority party, he's not going to become the majority leader. He, he's not going to become a powerful committee chair. Uh, that's going to go to, you know, Jay Costa is the, the top Senate Democrat right now, and he's beloved by UPMC, and then that, that's who he fights for. Uh, so, you know, the kind of the lower you go down on the power structure, the more honest they can be. Um, and, and hey, what's great. And so, yeah, he would say, organize, 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 connect with folks in other districts, build statewide power and fight. And that that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. And I think to, to add to Michael's point, it's 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 a matter of of uh, of degree. If we the more the, the larger we can build our forces, the more the, the politics, the only thing the politicians fear more than a, than a, a lobbyist is is the voter, uh, like an informed voter. Enough of them over, outweighs the money. They and 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 you can win. And a, a proof of this is Chris Rabb. He, the money was up against them. The whole party machine was against them. But he had inoculated so many people by going to their doors and having advocates like our, ourselves go to the doors and talk on his behalf. And that's really the kind of thing that needs to be happening. There's so much of this. You know, it te- remember, it was a whole decade um, where the Republicans controlled the House with a, mono- a 500,000 minority. Um, and that just wore on people. And, and now that this thing is flipped around, it's going to take a little bit before people are start to be able to Democrats are going to start to be able to stretch our muscles while we have the opportunity. We need to expand all over the, the freaking state to, to get to these new people and say, hey, listen, you need to start paying attention to us. If we can do that, just small groups all over the place, we can have a, an outsized influence on things. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where we want to hope to do. And really keep the pressure on Kinsey. <laughs> Uh, you know, he, he has some power, put the pressure on him, make him, make him do the right thing yeah. and, and keep the pressure on. Just remember, politicians are the last people to do the right thing. And what, what form does that pressure take? What is the most effective form for that pressure to take other than nonviolent actions and things like that? Yeah, um, I would just say that entire spectrum of nonviolence. So just uh, kind of think of it as forcing the encounter with with varying degrees of intensity. Lowest intensity being, you know, phone calls, emails, letters, that kind of thing. Middle uh, going into their office and and you know sitting them down and saying, hey, here's the gift ban bill. We need you to sign on to it. Um, we need you to go talk to your leadership about it and let them know you, you support it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the more intense is is. Uh, not going to be aimed at you know a Stephen Kinsey, but more at a um, you know a Jordan Harris, somebody with a little more power, uh, who's going to obstruct the the bill, um, and yeah, get, getting organized and active. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it also it also gives us an opportunity to flex our organizing muscles because yeah. these are things that a lot of people just don't do because they say, oh well, there's no point in it. There actually is. I mean, if it's part, if it's if it's a standalone event, um, they'll ignore you. But if it's part of an organized campaign. Oh, yeah. no, now they get nervous about it. Like they want to, and this is, I mean, literally Martin Harrisburg drove some of these people out of office. They did not <laughs> want to be around them anymore. And they were like, fuck it, I'm gone. So it works. Um, and this is just, you know, we have, a, this is a tiny army, but it is effective. And if we get any bigger, all oh, the things we can do. So let me just know, give which a is kind of what we're trying that. to do here, sort of build some sort of like, let's, let's get the PNN arm working with, March on Harrisburg and see what we, we can do. Mm-hmm. Just, just, just a, a quick story to illustrate, Tim, what you were just saying there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so House, when we started, we've dealt with um, six, eight different committee chairs uh, between the House and Senate state gov committees in, in the last six years. Um, that's how fast the turnover is in, in our wake. Uh, sometimes um, some of them do the right thing and stay, others go. Uh, but so we started with House State Gov uh, Committee Darryl, uh, Chairman Daryl Metcalf. He refused to talk to us. We protested, we pushed, we pushed, we pushed. We got the people around him to basically cut him off, marginalize him, push him aside. The first meeting with his replacement, the next House State Gov Committee Chair, his name was Garth Everett. I remember walking in and the first thing he said was, I'm not Daryl Metcalf. I'm not Daryl. I'm not Daryl. Let's talk. And I said, cool. <laughs> and we sat down. That was how big of an example we had made of his predecessor, that that was the first thing he said. We yeah. sat down, we talked, we got the gift ban out of committee a couple months later. Um, then uh, the next session- Hold we- on, my, hold on a second. Let, let's get Tia in here. She went, She had her hand raised for a while. Tia? Tia, you there? We're not hearing it to you. All right, let's hold off for a moment. Lin- Linnea? 
you have your hand Hi. Yeah. yeah okay. Um I uh so I and some other folks are meeting actually tomorrow morning to talk about um SB uh 143 and response to it and um i took a screenshot of the like picture you said like these are the six people and in looking at um the the committee it's gone to is a uh, local government which is now um so some folks have said that they don't think that the um i think it's freeman is the uh, the chair of that committee and they don't think that he'll bring it up for a uh, discussion um, that would be oh my um that would be uh what you were saying as far as like the the like the key leaders i'm trying to put together this and other people in our group have a, a clearer picture of what key leaders refers to um but i'm like my master's is in acting and i, I came to activism late so i'm trying to put together what that picture is um so we're talking like the head of the committee, the majority, uh, the Democratic majority, which since SB 143 passed 40 to 9 in the Senate, I'm a little bit nervous that there's more support among Democrats than than last year when it passed um, and there was a Republican majority. Now hey, we can I make a suggestion, Lenny? Let's let's have, let's take this offline. Can you give me a call tomorrow? I'm going to give you my telephone number. I'm going to put. I was, it I was actually going to ask Michael if he would come to the meeting. We're having an oh, there you go. <laughs> if you can, yeah. but now might be better. So I'm just wondering yeah. about those those leaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's just a few thoughts there. Uh, so Bob Freeman um, is is a Lehigh Valley or, or north of Lehigh Valley guy. Uh, pretty reasonable guy. If you sit down with him, um, you know, approach him as as a re as a reasonable adult. Make your your case based on facts, and and he should be all right there. If he's already not going to run this out of committee, then that that kills it completely, right? As the committee chair, he has control over whether that vote happens. So if he says no, then it's dead and, and it's done. Doesn't matter. If it does get through committee, then your two uh, other leadership folks are um, Matt Bradford is the new majority leader, and uh, Joanna Clinton is is the speaker of the house. The two of them will work as a team to set to see if it gets a, a full vote or not. Um, those are the folks you need to interact with. Uh, pressure them. Um, Democratic representatives know that their voters tend to be pro-environment, and so enough pressure on that can have an effect there. You can push the Democratic Party to be um, pro-environment and, and uh, you know, work on this stuff. Um, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, yeah, we've also heard that Shapiro is opposed, but of course we can't bet okay. on any of those things, so... And yeah, do me a favor. Shoot me an email about this because I want to put put you in touch with my environmental action team. They they might be interested in helping out as well. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. There's, uh, there's, yeah. Fantastic. Tia, are you there now? Uh, can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, yes. First of all, I'd like to thank Michael for the presentation. Second, I like to know if the presentation is available. It will be. We're gonna. I'm. We're. We're gonna. We're recording this, and when we're done, I'm going to uh, have it edited, and, and then I'll make it available for you guys. Okay. And three, do you all have a? Let's see what we can call it. A get on the bus fund, where uh, <laughs> where when you we need to roll out to Harrisburg, is there like a fund for that, where we can uh, you know just roll out at any given time. Absolutely. So, so when we do a, a mobilization to Harrisburg, yeah, we'll we'll do travel stipends um, and and carpools and and whatever we can to, to get folks there. Uh, we we uh, find people lodging in the city, um, often churches. One time for for some special accommodations, we put someone up in a hotel. Um, most of the time, just church floors, uh, people's houses, that kind of thing. Um, I have personally never paid for lodging anywhere in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm so proud of that. Uh, that's what yeah, looks like how they used to do it in the old days, right? We we slept <laughs> everywhere. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. 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 All right. So, um, great. Thank you, um, uh, Tom. Tommy. Yeah, uh, Michael. Thank you for the presentation. It was really informative. Um, I heard you and Tim uh, talking about the Democrat Party and how. Um, electing Democrats will help. Um, do you think there's really any difference between the two parties? And what do you think about a third party? Because um, I, I look at the federal government and I see how like the progressive wing, I don't see them really 
differentiating themselves from the conservatives. So, uh, so I, I just want your take on that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to bash any parties, Tim. I, I, no, 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 I don't give it because <laughs> I bash them all the time. I, okay, then I will bash them. Um, so uh, let me just say, uh, uh, both parties are playing the same game. Um, at the end of the day, they're playing this, they're playing in the same system. They're swimming around in the same swamp. They have different flavors. They have different priorities, but the values that undergird them are pretty similar. Um, there's a, a, there's bread and butter issues, and then there's wedge issues. Wedge issues are where the two parties disagree on very important things like abortion, gun control, uh, gay rights, uh, stem cell research. Um, you know those things that politicians uh, trans kids is now the is so stupid. I think they, they they attack whoever's marginalized and make it into a wedge issue, um, and that's kind of the how they differentiate themselves from each other. Uh, but then when it comes to issues like war and peace, you know the the military budget. Um, or ecological devastation, you know, uh, permits for drilling in Alaska, um, when it comes to wages, when it comes to, to most things, there, there isn't that much distinction between them. There's definitely distinction, but not that much. Uh, when it comes to ruling class interests, they tend to be united in, in what their campaign donors want them to be doing. Um, on social issues, there's a world of difference, and, and that's how they differentiate themselves. Um, and then I'll say third parties are are tough. Um, in our current system, it's set up to keep them out. So in our current system, let's say you're in a district that's 60% Democrat, 40% Republican uh, registered voters, and you run as a Green Party candidate or a Working Families Party candidate. You might win as the Working Families Party candidate 30%, the Democrat wins 30%, and then the Republican wins the election with 40%, and then they go to office. Right, that type of not having ranked choice voting, not having a runoff system, kind of really creates a disincentive for third party candidates because they could spoil the whole thing for everyone. Um, and they don't want to do that. So when you look at uh, places where they do have ranked choice voting, um, uh, there's a huge explosion of third parties and, and independents. Um, uh, New York City had it for 12 years in the 1930s and 40s uh, for their city council. They have it again now, but they used to have it. And we have all that data from that period. And it's when New York City became the greatest city in the world, uh, you know, going into the 50s, their, their prime decade. Um, and they had voting on, as well. Exactly, right? They had, they had on, their, on their city council, they had a member of the Communist Party. They had like two members of the worker and something or other party. Um, they had both socialist parties in the U.S. had representatives. They also had Republicans and they also had Democrats. Um, it was much more representative. So until we have a system of fusion voting, which Chris Rabb really pushed for, or ranked choice voting, which Chris Rabb also pushes for, and open primaries, which Chris Rabb also pushes for. <laughs> I think he actually put all three of those into a bill. I think he did, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not going anywhere, but it's it's a good bill. No, but um, we'll be, but but to, to Michael's point, it, it, it's really what you get. You get you get the the what you put into it. In, in other words, if we don't have enough people to, to 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 go out there and knock doors and talk about issues district by district and 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 flip these districts. Then we get what what we deserve. We get what we you know. If we don't we didn't put in the effort to, to flip it. We know that all of this is difficult. We know that money is really a factor, but we know that transparency and and an informed electorate are the only the only thing that can inoculate us from all the bullshit and all the money, and 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 that and we have to win it back. So I would say we're still in deep doo-doo because we may have, you know, barely won the house, but we still, all these people are still playing within the same system. If we can find more people like Art Haywood and Chris Rabb and others who are progressives and are saying, you know, the Republicans have that crazy caucus in, in the U.S. house. We need a yo caucus. We need a, you know, like a progressive caucus here of all these new members, like people we should be talking to these new people and say, hey, you want, you, you want to be on the same team here. Let's Let's form a caucus, because if we can do that, then we can really start to make some influence in, in, in these politics. We can start to get our people on committees. We can start to break these rules. But we, it's going to take a lot of work. This isn't happening overnight. And we're just going to we just got our feet wet. I mean, we're just starting to stretch because we just got one one of the of the chambers back. And it's going to take a while to shake it out. But be, I think if we do the work, I think I think we're, we may be able to do we may be able to flip this thing. So. 
Anyway, uh, listen, thank you everybody for coming. We're, we're kind of around like 17 minutes over time. I really appreciate everybody uh, doing this. M uh, Michael Pollack, thank you so much for, for your expertise on this and all the good inside stories. Uh, thank all of you for coming to this. Uh, there'll, there will be a recording available of this. Um, I'll, I'll get it in the next newsletter as soon as we can get this thing edited. Uh, thank you all for coming and, and be sure to check out the Friday newsletter. We're going to have all sorts of interesting things in there for you guys to do, including we're going to be starting with the elections coming up. So um, um, we'll talk about that. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Take care.